Hello and welcome. For anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. And this week we're exploring Arches National Park, as you can tell from, which way am I? This way, up here. Look for that, good to go. Hey, look at that. Okay, cool. Thanks, wife. We'll also vote near the end on the next national park we'd like to explore together. So keep an eye out for that and other posts coming in the chat. Uh, also feel free to post questions or thoughts. I removed my sort of cheesy prompt the audience questions. Uh, so just as you think of things, throw them out there. Uh, I enjoy chatting with all of you. So it's a lot of fun for me. Uh, I'll mention real quick while folks are, yeah, okay, cool. It seems like everyone's kind of figuring it out. So we're going to take off from the other end of the runway. It starts you on the other side. I made a note to fix that in the flight plan, but um, it's a little bit prettier and a little bit less uh, treacherous, we'll say. Uh, small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the sim today. So please don't try this in real life. I've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wikipedia pages. Using Wikipedia makes sure the facts here are cited and checked by others and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour together. To that end, if you notice anything missing or that could be better clarified, please help improve the Wikipedia pages. As the Wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Arches National Park. Oop, and before I take off here, I'll check out the chat. I see a bunch of things going on here. <laughs> Fact, I was using eight ball. That's funny. Thank you. Okay. We'll flip over here. Thank you, Fractals. All right, so we'll get my takeoff roll going. Now, I'll mention real quick that this is a relatively high uh, elevation airport, so you'll need a lot of the runway to take off, uh, which is part of the reason that we flipped sides here. So get my focus going. Now, I'm in a Cessna 152. This is actually the plane that I did most of my private pilots training in. A lot of folks are that way. Um, so... You know, I guess on the one hand, still don't judge me too hard, but uh, but hopefully it's it a little bit more natural. Okay, there we go. Pop herself out. Hey there, flying singer. Beautiful, beautiful Utah. Actually, we're on the Colorado side right now. Uh, we'll cross the border here in just a second. All right, so I gotta watch my climb rate here because we're so high up; it's uh, it's tricky. You gotta make sure you're hitting the right speeds. So I'll be a little bit attentive to that. Thank you, Fractals, for posting up the flight plan. A quick time sync for all the other planes flying along. So right now I am at actually I'm gonna advance this just a little bit. So I'm gonna put it at about 5:30. That seems to give me the best combination of kind of texture in the shadows without it being too too dull in the landscape. So I'd recommend the same, um, but play with it if you'd like. The sunset and sunrise times here are very pretty. Uh, a lot of the park suggestions actually are to go and, and go at different times of the day like sunset. All right, looks like everyone's falling along. Hello there. I might have the slowest plane in the group. Uh, some folks are using a 172 for the autopilot. A couple administrative updates. Um, I had mentioned last week that I was going to do a a poll on when we'd like to start doing casual flights throughout the week. So a quick deviation from that and then we'll circle back to that idea. So as you may know, this marks our 30th National Park Adventure. Uh, also Fractals That's Wild, right? Uh, went by in a blink of an eye. Uh, so 30 weeks of, of doing this. And so that means that next week will be our halfway point through the 62 national parks. It's actually 63 national parks now. Since we started the stream, uh, they have added a new national one, a new national park for the New River Gorge, um, but it's halfway point for, for us. So we're going to take a break for a couple of months after next week and prep for a season two. So that also means that next week will be our season one finale. Uh, Fractals and I are both pretty excited to put on kind of a, a fun little uh, send off here. So you'll see in our, our options for national parks are some pretty, pretty fun national parks at the end. All right, so back to the casual flights. So we've been exploring a lot of the United States national parks, which I love, uh, but I kept coming across other incredible parks around the world while I was doing my research. And so instead of a structured kind of researched flight like the one that we're doing today, where I'll have a couple of topics, instead we'll keep up the flying on Tuesdays. So same time, uh, same, same place, I suppose. Uh, but instead we'll start exploring more places around the world. So we'll maybe national parks in different areas, world heritage sites, for those of you who were here last week. I talked about World Heritage Sites. 
uh, lots of other fun, exciting adventures. It'll be a little more casual. So, uh, so yeah. So to summarize, so season one finale next week, and then after that we'll do some more postseason casual flights. Uh, and I'm excited to actually have a chance to hang out with you all in Discord. So a little, a little less talking head sort of set up and a little more, uh, a little more hanging out. All right, I'm gonna round off here at about six thousand feet. Get my plane trimmed up. And fractals, if you don't mind posting up the poll for this park. Or did I miss it? Oh, have you been to this national park? Okay, nice. Uh, okay, so not yet was 75% of the votes on Arches National Park. Uh, and I know Fractals mentioned beforehand that he had been a long time ago. I've never been to Arches. I do really want to go. Uh, Paul's already done final practice. Fractals is like he kept jabbering on, so I just did the poll. Yeah, it's probably probably a good call. Um, I have never been to the park. Uh, Samurai Sax is mentioning that uh, he had been here a couple times. Uh, so it's a, a fun place to go visit. Highly recommend. Uh, as with many of the national parks we visit, they're all pretty cool. Oh, is everyone just like cruising past me? That's so funny. Okay. <laughs> my nice little, my nice little uh, 152. All right, so let's talk about Arches National Park. Uh, now, I'm going to do a little bit of canyon flying here, which is pretty fun. So I'll stay kind of below the ridgeline for this part, and then when we get to the scenic parts, I'll kind of dip down and, and try and fly in between. Um, it's a little hard to, to go through topics while also flying, but I'll do my best here. <laughs> nice, picked by accident. Welcome. All right, so... Let's start off with the park purpose. So you may remember that each national park has something called a foundation document. This is sort of a statement of, uh, it's not just a statement, it's actually a pretty long document about why the park is important, uh, what it means, uh, what it does, that sort of thing. And part of that is something called the park purpose statement. So let me flip over here. The purpose of Arches National Park is to protect extraordinary examples of geologic features, including arches, natural bridges, windows, spires, balanced rocks, as well as other features of geologic, historic, and scientific interest, and to provide opportunities to experience these resources and their associated values in the majestic in their majestic natural settings. You'll see we'll talk a lot about these different uh, geological features and how they how they formed. Actually, let me pull up this real quick. So I will I'm gonna pop out of the plane so you can see a bit more of our surroundings here because it's very pretty. And then I will pull up this video. So this is a uh, a pretty quick moving, I would say, video about how the park was formed. Uh, they'll hit on a bunch of different topics, and we'll talk about the salt bed and some of the salt parts of it later. So if that flies by too fast, we'll, we'll cover it in a bit more detail. Uh, but this, in my opinion, was the most useful overview of sort of oh, what, sure. what the park is and where it came from. Um, so if you've ever wondered why there are so many uh, arches in this particular area, this is this is the answer. 300 million years ago, our Earth's surface was very different. The land masses were drifting, colliding, and transforming. As tectonic forces pushed and pulled what was to become North America, the ancestral Rocky Mountains rose. To the west of these mountains, faulting and subsidence created the Paradox Basin. Over the next 15 million years, changing sea levels filled the basin 29 times. Each time the oceans receded, salt water became trapped in the basin. The trapped water evaporated, leaving a massive deposit of salt over 5,000 feet thick. As time passed, the mountain range eroded. Vast amounts of sand, rock, and debris accumulated on top of the salt layer. Under this tremendous pressure, the softer salt beds were forced westward. When the salt encountered deep faults, it was blocked and forced upwards. Over the next 75 million years, an enormous salt wall, two miles high, three miles wide, and over 70 miles long was created. Eventually, the salt stopped flowing, and a mile-thick layer of rock was deposited over it. Then, some 60 to 70 million years ago, 
tectonic forces cause some of the deeper rock to bend, forming a dome. Long, parallel cracks called joints formed in this bent rock. Later, when the Colorado Plateau rose, the Colorado River and its tributaries eroded away most of this mile-thick layer of stone. When the cracks became exposed at the surface, water seeped through the joints, allowing some of the salt to dissolve. With this salt removed, the unsupported stone collapsed over time, creating Salt Valley. At the edges of Salt Valley, some of the remaining fractured rock layers continue to erode, forming thin sandstone walls called fins. These fins were slowly worn down and sand collected between the closely spaced vertical walls. Slightly acidic rainwater combined with carbon dioxide in the air, forming carbonic acid in this trapped sand. Over time, the acid dissolved the calcium carbonate that held the sandstone together, slowly wearing away the rock until openings were formed. In other fins, an exposed layer of weaker rock lay beneath the stronger one. The weaker stone weathered first, undercutting the upper layers and creating a hole. In both cases, the weight of the overlying rock caused fracturing above the opening. Eventually, gravity pulled the loosened stone away, creating the distinctive natural arch formations. Water and time continued a relentless sculpting of this landscape, creating and transforming the natural wonders of Arches National Park. Wasn't that just the most efficient three-minute overview of that of that process? So, so a lot of things happened there. We talked about the uh, old oceans drying up, and then I uh, forming layers after layers of sand. And then we talked about that sand kind of getting all pushed together. We'll talk a little bit more about that deposit of of overburden, that deposit of sediment on top, uh, and then the structures that form because of it as it expands, cracks, and then you get your fins. So you'll see those when we go into the park, we'll, we'll fly over a couple of places where you can see those artifacts, but it's most clearly seen, uh, in my opinion, in the fiery furnace. So we'll pass that probably about 70% of the flight through. Um, and you'll see, I mean, you can see the fins super clearly. Uh, it's part of the, the magic of the park. All right, now I know the plane was a little loud in my headphones, so do let me know if that's, uh, if that's getting to be too much. Um, but otherwise, I'll keep out of the plane a little bit more because it's kind of, uh, it's not kind of, it's a very pretty park. All right, so that's a bit of background on arches. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll talk, our second topic today, we'll hit a little bit more on some of those geological aspects. But let's talk about our person of the week. So this person of the week is Edward Abbey. And Edward Abbey looks like this. And he was an American writer excuse me, he was an American writer uh, and a park ranger at Arches National Monument, monument before it was a national park, in 1956 and 1957, where he kept journals uh, that became his book Desert Solitaire. The success of Abbey's book, as well as interest in adventure travel, has drawn many hikers, mountain bikers, and off-pavement driving enthusiasts to the area. Uh, I'll talk in just a moment about what his book was about, um, but keep in mind that his book caused a lot of tourism in the area, which is good for the area. But um, So Edward Paul Abbey was an, uh, lived from 1927 to 1989. He was an American author and essayist noted for his advocacy of environmental issues and criticism of public land policies. His best-known works included Desert Solitaire, a nonfiction autobiographical account of his time as a park ranger at Arches National Park and considered to be an iconic work of nature writing and a staple of early environmentalist writing. In it, he describes his stay in the canyon lands of southeastern Utah from 1956 to 1957. It's a little bit of a misstatement. He spent a summer each, he spent each of the summers there, so he didn't spend the whole time there. Desert Solitaire is regarded as one of the finest nature narratives in American literature. Small disclaimer, I haven't actually read the book. I am more inclined to now that I know it exists, uh, but it is supposed to be very good. Um, a rave reviews, not just from the time, but even still. In that book, Abby vividly describes the physical landscapes of southern Utah and delights in his isolation as a backcountry park ranger, recounting adventures in nearby canyon country and mountains. 
He also attacks what he terms industrial tourism and resulting development in the national parks. As since we visited these other national parks, I'll mention he was also a seasonal park ranger at Florida Everglades, and then as a fire lookout in Lassen Nas Volcanic National Park. So two parks that we've also visited. As a last fun fact on uh, Edward Abbey, so Abbey dedicated an earlier book he had written called Black Sun to his wife, Judy. His, I think, third wife of four or five wives, uh, Judy. And uh, so he dedicated that book to his wife, Judy. At, however, the book was not a novel about his relationship with Judy. Instead, it was a story about a woman that Abby had had a, uh, an affair with while he was married to Judy in 1963. Uh, apparently, the novel was, quote, a bone of contention in their marriage, which is fair. That seems like a pretty poor choice as far as these things go. But he's better known for his Desert Solitaire book. All right, so that's Edward Abbey, kind of a, an interesting character. There were a couple of other really interesting aspects to how the park was formed, but no one that was well known enough um, to kind of spend that the bit of time on for a person of the week. Um, but if you want to know more about how the park was formed, there's some interesting kind of back and forth with professors in University of Michigan uh, and some other people who had just come to visit the area. Lots of railroad history too. All right, perfect timing, Fractals. So Fractals put up a, poll, a post for our first topic here, which is red foxes. And so the poll question is, how many urination postures does a red fox have? Is it one for male, one for female, right? Or 12, or 12, but they prefer to call them urination extravaganzas. We give folks a second to vote here. While people are voting on that, um, let me pull up, I believe, and I want to double check this real quick, but I believe we are flying over the Colorado, yeah, Colorado River right here. So uh, kind of an interesting part of the country as well. A beautiful river. All right, so a red fox, you may have seen them before. They're, they're fairly common. So this, when it loads, is what they look like. So there's a red fox. Uh, the red fox, by its scientific name Vulpus vulpus, is the largest of the true foxes and one of the most widely distributed members of the order uh, Carnivora. Carnivora is the order of placental mammals that specialize primarily in eating flesh, which covers a lot of animals. I'm not going to list them all out here, but it's um, a lot of animals. A lot of mammals, excuse me. Apart from its size, the red fox is distinguished from other fox species by its ability to adapt quickly to new environments. Despite its name, the species is often produces individuals with other colorings. There are 45 subspecies currently recognized, which are divided into two categories, the large northern foxes and the south, small southern gray desert foxes of Asia and North Africa. All right, looks like we have our votes in on the poll. Okay, so in this case, the answer was uh, letter C. They call them urination extravagant. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> They are. No, hello there, Xbox Master. <laughs> Coming in hot in a King Air, it looks like. Um, so the answer for this one is actually 12. So they have 12 urination postures, and they need that many, not just kind of uh, female and male posture, but they need that many because they use urine, we'll talk about it in just a second, to mark uh, particular areas. And so they need to make sure that they can mark them very precisely. And so they have 12 different options for how to do that. All right, so like I was saying, the red fox, a kind of overview of what they look like, the red fox has an elongated body and relatively short limbs. The tail, which is larger than half the body length, is fluffy and reaches the ground when in standing position. Pull up a picture of that. They are very agile, and they're capable of jumping over six and a half foot fences, and they also swim well. So there's that tail hitting the ground. It's also a winter coat that it's got on there. Their skulls are fairly narrow and elongated with small brain cases. Also, brain cases is a wonderful word. I had not heard that used before, but we'll fit that into sentences next week. Uh, it's a good challenge. Their canine teeth are relatively long, so this is just to show uh, kind of the canine teeth mostly. On average, adults measure 14 to 20 inches in height at the shoulder, so a little less than two feet uh, to the shoulder, and then 8 to 38 inches in body length, so a pretty big range, with tails measuring 12 to 22 inches. 
and they can be found in several different colors. So here's some of those color options you might see. A little bit of terminology on them. So males are called tods, that would be a British word for it, or dogs. Females are called vixens, and young cubs are known as kits. So you can hear me talk about kits mostly today. So where do they live? At present, uh, they live, uh, they're, they're present across the entire Northern Hemisphere, including most of North America, Europe and Asia, and parts of uh, North Africa. They've also been introduced into Australia, where they're considered harmful to native mammals and bird populations, and they're included on the list of the world's 100 worst invasive species. Not a good reputation to have. I'm going to quick flip out of this, and I'm actually going to head over, and we're going to cut this corner off so we can approach this area called Big Bend. Make sure that I'm going to clear this ridge line here. So what kind of adaptations do red foxes have? They have some adaptations to temperature. So the fur in thermal window areas, uh, such as the head or the lowered legs, is kept dense and short all year round. While fur in other areas changes with the seasons. So we showed that picture of a winter fur coat earlier. They actively control the peripheral uh, blood veins and by expanding or contracting them to regulate heat, heat loss. They can actually expand or contract their, their blood veins. Purple foxes have binocular vision, but their uh, sight reacts mainly to movement. Their auditory perception is acute and they can hear squeaking of mice about a football field away. Their sense of smell is good, but weaker than that of like a specialized dog, for instance. And I was talking about the urination before, so they use urine to mark their territories. Urine is also used to mark empty cache sites used to store found food as reminders not to waste time investigating them. So after they've cleared out their cache site, then they'll use one of their 12 urination posters to make sure that they accurately mark where, no longer, where they no longer need to look for food, for stored food. All right, here's Big Bend in the park. So you kind of enter the park as soon as you cross the Colorado here. We're going to follow along to the visitor center, and then we'll just fly through the park. There's no wrong way to see the park, though. It's, it's pretty cool. So what do red foxes eat? They primarily feed on small rodents, although they may target rabbits, game birds, reptiles, invertebrates, uh, young ungulates as well. Uh, and I'll show you a video of them hunting a mouse, which is... It's kind of cute. I tried to find, we'll just watch the first 30 seconds, I tried to find a couple of videos so you could see them actually behaving. Um, I think that's a more interesting aspect of the, of the animal. Got him. So that's what they eat. Now they're vulnerable to attack from larger predators, such as wolves, large predatory birds, such as golden eagles, and medium and large sized felines. They have a pretty uh, interesting social life. So red foxes are usually found together in pairs or small groups consisting of families, such as a mated pair and their young, or a male with several females having kinship ties. The young of a mated pair remain with their parents to assist in the caring for new kids. So if the young stay around longer, then they'll, raise, they'll help raise the next generation of kids. The average litter size consists of about four to six kits, although litters of up to 13 have occurred. And the kit size are initially blue, but change to amber at four to five weeks. Oops. I should be checking the chat too. All I saw was the streamer's very handsome, so caught my eye. Turbo Extreme, hello. Not all foxes. It's funny. Yeah, it is an angry yawn. It is so beautiful. And this park is, is really, really something, yeah. Hey there, Froin033. Just wing it. Fractals. So, <laughs> Fractals, do you, want, do you want to explain the eight ball thing or do you want me to explain it? Let's get again, okay. I'll let you guys have fun with that. A lot of cop-out answers from the eight ball. A last bit on their social life. So red foxes may leave their families once they reach adulthood if the chances of winning a territory on their own are high. 
If not, they'll stay with their parents and can postpone uh, at the cost of postponing their own reproduction. So it has a cost to them if they do that, but that's one way that they might approach it. I'm going to start descending here and get down a little bit lower. Flip to this mode. When we fly through these canyons, I'll have to be a little bit more uh, cognizant of flipping back and forth. So red foxes have a couple of different ways they communicate. They use body language for many things. Red foxes' body language consists of movement of ears, tail, and postures, with their body markings emphasizing certain gestures. They're typically, the postures are either aggressive or a dominant, dominant posture, or feel fearful and submissive. So this would be kind of a, an inquisitive posture. They also use many vocalizations. I won't play one here because it sounds a lot like a dog yipping, which a lot of people have probably heard. Um, but that is kind of interesting if you want to look it up. There's some some good clips of that. All right, so here we are entering Park Avenue. Now, on our way to the next one, I'll pull up some pictures of this in real life, but uh, there's some add-ons that I recommended in the flight plan uh, from, I can't remember the two folks' name, Jepson2001 and... Um, let me see if I can remember the other one. And Richard something. Uh, that really did a good job with capturing this. So thank you to those folks for this really pretty incredible fly through of Park Avenue. All right, so that's Park Avenue and you can do a little hiking trail there. It's highly recommended. There's also the Three Gossips is a formation right here. Looks kind of like Three Gossips. It was, it's kind of interesting to compare this to like Mammoth Cave. So Mammoth Cave, you'll remember, had a lot of things named after mythology and sort of like the river sticks and things. Um, the description for this park was that it's sort of a call it as you see it type namings where it's, what does it look like? That's what it's going to be called. I'll turn around here and quick and look back at Park Avenue. So you can see some of these fins already that, that was talked about in the video. Let me pull up some pictures here so you can see. So here is Park Avenue. When you go to visit, that's what it'll look like. Oh, I'll mention there's a couple of faces in these renderings that are just missing. So if it looks like there's a weird gap in the, the field, that's why. Um, just part of the way it was rendered. Just a moment here while I avoid stalling. Okay. Courthouse Tower was just at the end of Park Avenue, so we just passed that. And then the three gossips I mentioned, that little structure. Looks pretty accurate to, to what we saw, which is pretty cool. As far as living, red foxes either establish stable home ranges within particular areas, or they'll uh, roam with no fixed abode. During outside of the breeding, breeding season, most red foxes favor living in the open in densely vegetated areas, although they may enter burrows to escape bad weather. Uh, they have relatively simple dens, and they look kind of like this. Oh, I still have my... Oops, I was still showing the screen there. Well, I guess that's okay. So that's what their dens look like. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Just a place for airflow and a little storage room off to the side. They're also represented... Uh, oh, okay, yeah, so that's that's those two parts. Let me do this. So I'm going to turn off. There's that park road kind of cuts through the main thing. You pass along a great wall here. I'm going to cut over, finish foxes real quick, and then we'll do a little bit of sightseeing. So we're coming up towards the windows. You'll see the the arches. They're also, when they're a pair, they're called a... Uh, thank you. When they're a pair, the pair of arches are sometimes called the spectacles because they kind of look like glasses. You'll see them when you come up to them. So last little bit on foxes. Because of its wide distribution and large population, the red fox is one of the most uh, most important fur-bearing animals uh, harvested for the fur trade. So fox fur, for instance, this sort of thing you might see a lot. They're also represented in human folklore and mythology. For example, the nine-tailed fox of China. There's a lot of other mythology around them, depending on the parts of the world. Uh, so if you're curious to learn about that, I would recommend looking into it. Since they're too small to pose a threat to humans, red fox has extensively benefited from the presence of human habitats uh, and has successfully colonized many suburban and urban areas. Domestication of the red fox is also underway in Russia, 
and has resulted in a domesticated red fox. So they were able to domesticate at least uh, a small set. All right, so in summary, the red fox is the largest of the true foxes and one of the most widely distributed members of the order Carn Carnivora. Apart from its large size, the red fox is distinguished from other foxes, fox species by its ability to adapt quickly to new environments, including human, urban, and suburban habitats. All right, just ahead of me here is the windows. So there's one arch, I think that's called turret arch, and there's a turret off to my right. And then there's the windows, there's one side of the windows. We'll fly right over it and then I'm gonna pop back. I'll, I'll see it from the other side. Let's see if I can fly this plane backwards. So there's both windows, you can see them. Kind of side by side there. Sorry, we just had a moment. I will uh, I'll spin back around. We're gonna fly up along this part of the, the area to see double arch. So the windows look like that in real life. And we're going to come up on double arch in just a moment. You've probably seen pictures of it. So this is what double arch looks like. It's got two arches off of the same sort of base here. It's a pretty cool one. All right, and I'll switch back so you can actually see the, the stream here. All right, let me get myself oriented. This would be so fun in real life if it, like having a bunch of pilots flying around Arches National Park. It's not exactly legal, but you know, it's okay. Oh, the other thing about this plane, you can look out the windows on top. So. All right, so there's the double arches right there, just off my compass. I'll fly by at a little bit of speed here. Oops, yeah. Sorry about that, let me tell you what, I'll just pause this super quick spin around so you can kind of see it just slightly better. So it's kind of nestled into this area. You can walk right up to it. A little parking area there. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so that covers red foxes. And now you know enough about foxes to answer a particular question. So think back, we talked about thermoregulation with foxes. And so the question is, why do foxes have a winter coat? Uh, the answer is because they look silly in sweaters. <laughs> All right, I just had to get my little, little joke in there. Um, quickly while we pass here, this is the actual location of Balanced Rock. Um, I, at some point in uh, later on, I will end up filing a bug to Microsoft Flight Simulator because they do have a rendering of Balanced Rock, but it's in the wrong place. So that's where it should be. Uh, when we fly by it, I will show you. I will point out where they have it. You'll see it. It shows up pretty clearly. Um, but this is what it looks like. And thank you, Fractals, for getting that one up. So there's Balanced Rock. They mentioned for this one, as well as for Landscape Arch, that they're, uh, you know, these structures fall apart over time. Uh, and so you never know when they're going to be gone. Uh, it's a little bit depressing to think about too long, so so probably don't do that. But um, but you should go visit, because, you know, you never know. Uh, there was a, a famous one that fell, I think, in 2008, um, and just sort of one day it was gone. So Balanced Rock is sort of on that list. It's this enormous rock with a pretty shaky pedestal underneath it. Thanks. See, see, okay. So I see a bunch of people voting on this one. Let me flip back to the, the stream here. Another pretty area of the park we're flying over here. Much less visited. So why do salt domes, what do salt domes, the crab nebula, and lava lamps all have in common? Is it they're all examples of a less dense material pushing through a more dense material? Is it they all, they're all expressions of uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability, or all of the above? I see a couple of votes on the first one, and most of the folks uh, voted for the last one, which is the correct answer in this case. I'll flip back around so you can see this as we're leaving this area. Pretty part to just fly, fly in and around. All right, oops. And we are off to Delicate Arch next. 
Delicate Arch is one of the most uh, famous parts of the park. So I'll pull up a couple of pictures when we get there and you'll, you'll recognize it instantly. All right, so the correct answer on that one was all of the above. And our second topic today, I'm actually very excited about. It was one of those topics that I came across when I was researching and I had never, it had never even occurred to me that this would be a thing. Um, so I hope that you have a, a pleasant sort of aha moment uh, as much as I did. Uh, and I'll do my best to talk through it. It's a lot of topic, it's a lot of an area that I'm not as familiar with. So I, I took a, uh, a basic geology course at one point in my life, but it's been a long time. Um, so, so I'll do my best, but, um, but hopefully the, the broad strokes are still pretty fun. You can see just off to our left here that little structure in the distance, uh, just off my left wing tip here, I'll look out the window at it. So that's where they put balanced rock uh, for anyone flying around if you want to go check it out. That's pretty cool, uh, and they do an okay job with the rendering, it's just not in the right spot, which is too bad. Okay, um, while we come up to it, here are a couple of pictures of Delicate Arch. And I want to pull these up first because you'll recognize some of the different structures. So here's Delicate Arch, the kind of classic photo. Now there's a view from above that's kind of helpful. So this is one from another angle. Okay, and you'll see people kind of going under the arch. You get a little bit of size of perspective there for how big it is. And then I'll pull up Delicate Arch and the panhole. So this is another angle on it. This is I didn't realize that there was a, a this panhole right next to it. So when we fly over it, you'll see that pretty clearly as well. Um, one of the drawbacks of using the scenery is you lose the um, modeled version. So Microsoft Flight Simulator has done a model of Delicate Arch. It's in the correct location. Um, but I decided to use the um, add-on, which removes the model but replaces it with... It's a little bit more... Um, it's a less detailed model, but it gives a better sense of the rest of the area around it, including the panhole. So when we fly over there, uh, keep an eye out for that. I'll pop out here so you can kind of see where we're going. Oops, okay. Flip that one. We got some real zippy planes. Maybe I'm just uh, me and my low and slow plane today. All right. Um, let's let's do this. We'll just take a moment here and we can enjoy delicate arch and then I will dive into salt tectonics. Um, which by the way the tectonics is similar in kind of meaning to like tectonic plates. So it's a uh, similar sort of geological processes at play. Different application but all right, there is our delicate arch. And there's that panhole. So when you go to visit, you can actually you walk around the edge there, and you get to see that um, the arch. And that's why they recommend going at sunset because if I flip this here, I'll fast forward a little bit here, and you'll see sunset. You get these really cool views. Oops, make sure my plane's gonna fly as it kind of sets through. But then also at sunrise, you get the opposite direction, right? Like you get oops, maybe not this time of year. Um, but you do get um, pretty spectacular views there. So a lot of folks trying to fly through the arch. I hope it's, uh, it's hard. I was trying to do it when I was practicing. All right, let me flip back to uh, what is it about six p.m. or so. Okay, back on track. So salt tectonics. So connection to the park, how does this relate to what we're talking about? You may remember uh, a couple of things. One, we talked about plate tectonics at Pinnacles National Park. So this is slightly different, but it also impacts the layers of rock you may see at a park like Arches. So in the case of Pinnacles, the plates had moved half of a volcano along the coast of California. In the case of Arches, it's actually salt beds that were creating these sorts of things. We saw that in the video at the beginning. So first, the National Arches, Arches National Park lies above an underground salt bed. Over millions of years, the salt bed was covered with debris and sediment. The weight of this cover caused the salt bed below to liquefy and thrust up layers of rock into salt domes. We saw that all in the video that kind of gathered and formed these domes. So to recap, there's a salt bed under sediment that liquefied and caused layers of rocks to be thrust upwards. 
Oops, and I am flying just all over different directions here. I turned on this, uh, it's called breadcrumbs. So I turned this on so you could see where I was flying, and now it's just showing how much I'm, <laughs> I'm meandering everywhere. That's all right. Let me get myself back on track here just a moment. All right, so first let's talk about salt. There's two things you need to know about salt before we can really get into this. The first one is that salt behaves as a fluid rather than a rigid, rigid structure over geological timescales. So it's a fluid, right? The other thing is that salt is often less dense or more buoyant than the surrounding rock. This means that the less dense substance will find a way to rise through or away from the more dense one. Just like if you put something more dense, more dense liquid in water, then you get something more dense. All right, and we'll take a quick pause here for Fiery Furnace. Sorry, this is going to be broken up a little bit as we fly around. This is the part of the park that really emphasizes those fins. Uh, there are some really fun YouTube videos of folks exploring these. You can go through different hiking trails and they kind of walk through these fins. You can see them really split, some narrow caverns and stuff. Um, really pretty incredible part of the park. <laughs> Crazy Tycho, what a great one. Oh, that's, that's so funny. Excellent. Sodium chlorine and more ionic duo. Too funny. All right, so that's the fiery furnace. And you'll see they have uh, balance rock just off to the in the background there, which again isn't correct, but that's okay. All right. Uh, quick pictures of fiery furnace. So this is what it looks like from the inside of the furnace. And then this is a panoramic picture of kind of what it looks like. So it's pretty accurate uh, with these with these models to, to what the park actually looks like. And we're going to be coming up here in just a moment on landscape arch. And so I'm going to pull up a picture of that now so you have it kind of in your mind. And then I'll point it out. It's nestled against a rock, and so it's kind of easy to miss if you're not on the ground. So this is landscape arch. This is the longest arch in the park and the fifth longest in the world. It's also, uh, just for scope of how big an arch we're talking about, this is the size of a football field. So this is 300 feet. Uh, it's like 330 feet long or so. Um, so it's a, a really enormous park. Um, there's also a video online of a small piece of the arch cracking off and falling uh, a couple of years back. So, um, you know, something to keep in mind, I guess. You'll notice in the game, then we have that same sort of fin structure, so that's how those arches form. Uh, let me... we're coming up on it here. The other one, double O arch, is really hard to see in the game, but I'll pull it up here so you can see it now. Uh, and this is just two arches sort of stacked on top of each other. It's a pretty cool structure. It does show up in, in this game, um, but it's not as, as clear. So there's pine tree arch right there. There's a landscape arch you can see just off my wing. Oops, let me switch over here so you can see it a little bigger. So there's landscape arch. And this area is called Devil's Garden. It has uh, tons and tons of arches. You can go and, and hike back here. It's one of those, if you are feeling like you want to have a long hike sort of day, this is a good one to go visit. And then double O arch coming up here. We'll turn around double O arch so you can see it, but uh, like I said, it's it doesn't show up super well. All right, and what I'm going to do here actually is I'm going to, instead of leaving the park, because the rest of it's just sort of landing, um, I'm actually going to, oops, where is my, there we go. Did I lose it? Oh, there it is. So there's double O arch just off to my left wing there. You can see the top one kind of coming through. All right, so I'm going to fly back the same way I came uh, and talk a little bit more about uh, salt tectonics, because um, like, like I said, the arch, or the park is gorgeous, so. May as well spend a minute longer here. All right, now that I'm no longer distracted. So the we talked a little bit about uh, salt as a substance. So remember, it's less dense than the rock around it. Together, that means that salt can actually flow out from under rock, something like this. And so you'll see on the bottom image here is sort of a cross section of what it could look like. So you have an overlayer of rock, and the salt actually gets squeezed out and put on top. And you can form something called, well, you can form a lot of different things because of it, but I'll show a picture later of a salt glacier, which is a structure that can form because of um, because of that sort of uh, salt flow. I'm going to pop out of the plane again. 
instead of continuing to look around every direction. All right, so that brings us to salt tectonics. So salt tectonics is concerned with the geometries and processes associated with the presence of significant thicknesses of salt beds containing rock salt within a layered sequence of rocks. This is caused by both the low salt density, which does not increase with burial, and its low strength. Salt structures, uh, excluding unformed layers of, uh, sorry, undeformed layers of salt, which so is just a layer, it doesn't count, have been found in more than 120 sedimentary basins across the world. There's about three different types of salt structures that can form, and we're going to talk about all three, so passive, active, and reactive. All three are different ways salt is trying to get above the more dense overburden. And you remember when we talked about coal mining in New River Gorge, overburden is just anything that is on top of the mineral of interest. So when we were talking about coal mining, overburden was anything above the coal. In this case, overburden is anything above the salt. Uh, so here's a picture of all three of those, and we'll talk about each one individually, but there's active salt structures, passive salt structures, and then reactive salt structures. So an active salt structure forms uh, when there are active, active plate tectonics. So you see this sort of movement of the overburden, which causes faulting both to reduce the strength of the overburden and or thin it. So in this case, you can see it sort of uh, folding in over itself. And as that tectonic activity occurs, that allows the salt to um, kind of flow in between those, those newly formed cracks. You also can have a reactive salt structure. So in this case, the salt layers don't necessarily uh, Oh, I'm sorry. In the cases where you don't necessarily have the ability for passive salt structures to form, you can get sort of reactive salt structures uh, where it just moves into areas of relatively low pressure around developing folds and faults. So it's not necessarily following um, a particular uh, tectonic activity, but it's just if there's natural folds and faults, it'll kind of fill in those spaces. That's reactive structure. And this is sort of what it looks like more typically, which is that it's just moving to layers, right? So you have this basement layer and the salt's just kind of flowing to the lower layers, um, kind of like water underground. So that's reactive. The last one you can have is called a uh, passive salt structure. And so this requires no tectonic movement and it has to do with the densities of the materials involved. So like I mentioned, pure salt is less dense uh, than, let me start again, pure salt is more dense than sediments when it's first deposited. So when the sedimentary layer is first formed, salt is more dense. But as that sedimentary layer compacts, then it becomes more dense than salt. And so it goes from where pure salt is about 21,000 kilograms per square meter, and the sediment, sediment is 20,000, so 21,000 for salt, 20,000 for the uncompressed sediment. Over time, that sediment compresses to about 25,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which means that it, it just becomes more dense than the salt does. All right, here we are back at Delicate Arch again. Hello, long time no see. All right, so because of that, uh, once the overlayers have become, the, the overburden has become denser, the weaker salt tends to deform in a characteristic series of ridges and depressions, and this is due to Rayleigh-Taylor instability. We're not going to dive into the math or physics behind it, um, but you'll recognize it right away. So let me show you another picture here. This is the passive salt ridges forming, and this is kind of how they would form in a park like arches. So you start off with this constant thickness layer of salt, and it slowly moves into these ridges and networks, and then over time the overburden compresses, uh, well I guess it rises out technically, so the salt is rising up above the overburden. And it does so in these characteristic ways, these sort of ridges here, until you get salt domes that occur, which we saw in that first uh, first image. So as it rises in those ridges, then you get these salt domes, right? And so knowing that you'd have this sort of uh, forming, you'd expect to see salt domes in real life, right? And sure enough, you do see things like, here's one salt dome. You can see the salt itself is actually this, uh, oops, I lost my place in the picture, is this white uh, block here is the actual, that's the salt dome that, that is now just visible from, from the sky. You can also get glacial flows. So that first image I showed had salt actually kind of flowing out. So here's an example of that one. 
So this is all a glacial, uh, salt glacier, excuse me, flowing out. Again, just like how glaciers are actually uh, liquid under geo geo uh, geological timescales, same as salt, and so you get those same sorts of artifacts from a salt flow. All right, so I mentioned this thing called uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh Taylor instability. And this is where I started to get into the topic and go, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. We got to talk about this one. So Rayleigh Taylor instability is an instability that occurs um, when two fluids of different densities, uh, between two fluids of different densities, where the lighter fluid is pushing the heavier fluid. So a classic example of this would be when you go and put milk in your coffee in the morning or in your tea and it causes those chaotic swirls to occur. So that's a sort of uh, a style of Rayleigh-Taylor instability. And so although it looks chaotic when you put it in the milk, it's actually not, it's, it's predicted by this sort of thing. So a, a super clean example of what this looks like is this. This would be like a classic Rayleigh-Taylor and you'll notice there's this bulge, so sort of look like the salt dome, but also you can get more structures and these curls. And then eventually you get this sort of almost mushroom looking uh, piece to the top with these these curls underneath. So in this case, the yellow is more dense and the blue is pushing through it. So that's an important part of what's going on here. Now, the same sort of mixing of den densities occurs in a lot of different places. So one of them is uh, volcanic eruption. So if you have a volcano that erupts or if you have a bomb go off and there's a mushroom cloud that's formed. So this is sort of a, a time-lapse picture of one, but you'll see that same mushroom shape and then you actually see some of those same artifacts that we had in the previous image, right? So you get that same sort of uh, kind of undercurrents almost here. They have a name for these, I can't remember it though. All right. Interestingly, it's also the same thing that gave the Crab Nebula its distinct fingers. So let me pull up this real quick. So if you look at this one, that is the same Raleigh, uh, Rayleigh Taylor instability that forms those ridges is the exact same reason that we have the ridges in that passive salt structure that I was talking about just a moment ago. So it's forming those ridges because of the more dense and less dense material. Same basic principles then give us the uh, crab nebula. And then the last one I'll mention here, uh, and so this and crab nebula is a supernova explosion from about a thousand years ago. Uh, so that's kind of where it came. It, it, it's that, again, it's that lower density material pushing through a higher density. In this case, it was because the nebula had more dense material there and then a supernova occurred on the inside or something. There's a particular reason why this one formed like that. Um, and it has to do with the density of the material surrounding the explosion. And then the last one that you are maybe uh, familiar with and is a favorite example of uh, Raleigh-Taylor instability is a lava lamp. So it's the same sort of thing. It's that more dense material getting pushed up I'm sorry, less dense material getting pushed up through a more dense material, and it forms these sort of characteristics, characteristic bulges, and, um, and eventually sort of a mushroom shape. So again, if you think back to that picture of the salt domes and the, the salt ridges, very similar to a lava lamp, uh, which I thought was just so interesting that if you think about the what's going on you know, under the hood of Arches National Park, it's a little bit like a lava lamp. All right, so in summary, Salt behaves as a fluid rather than a rigid structure over geologic timescales. Uh, and salt is often less dense or more buoyant than surrounding rock. Together, this means salt will try to rise through rock, forming an active, reactive, or passive salt structures, or sometimes a mix of them, so it's not necessarily just one or the others. The way it rises follows the same rules as Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which is the same process at work in lava lamps and the other examples we talked about. So of course, salt got me thinking, right? And you ever notice on salt packets, they'll say things like, created from 250 million year old Himalayan rock, uh, rock salt bed. It's like 250 million year old salt coming out of the rock bed or whatever. But then on the label, it says expires June, 2022, right? It's kind of wild really, but I guess I'm, I'm glad that they dug it up just in time. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll do one more pass here through uh, through Park Avenue. And Fractals, do you mind posting up our last poll here? So this will be uh, voting on which national park we like to go to for season one finale. 
Uh, so a couple of, of fun park options, in my opinion. Um, and then that's the one we'll do for our last week here. And again, we'll continue doing uh, Thursday flights. Um, so, or excuse me, Tuesday flights, 7 o'clock Pacific time, same sort of time. Um, we'll go to more places around the world, so it should be a blast. And uh, hope, hope to get to hang out with all of you a little bit more. Um, be a little more, a little more casual flights, uh, but just as fun. Fractals put that one up there. So we have Yellowstone National Park, Glacier National Park, and Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, unsurprisingly, some of my favorite national parks as well. I always tell people Glacier National Park is the... Anyone who I know who has been to Glacier National Park, it is their favorite national park, myself included. Anyone who has not been to Glacier National Park, I always tell them it's it's worth the trip because um, it's really it's really pretty, really pretty something else. I see it's got no votes though, so you know <laughs> it's all right. I won't take it personally. This is okay. Give people just a second more. I remember the wife uh, is a tiebreaker. We'll give her. I think that's probably it. Uh, probably at fractal. So, wife, do you wanna do you wanna make the tiebreak call on this one? Oh, well, while uh, we're waiting for that, uh, fractals added this command called uh, exclamation point number eight ball, and he put in a bunch of pilot related puns. So if you type in. Uh, exclamation point uh, number eight ball it'll like you're rolling an eight ball basically so it'll give you sort of a you can ask it a question um, sort of thing and so fractals was playing with that earlier that's what that was i don't know if that got explained or not but um, i think anyone can do it so you know feel free i i have not checked out the pilot related puns so i hope that they're all uh, at least grown worthy <laughs> we had two more, two more people vote, but for the, <laughs> for the opposite sides of it. So, uh, why don't we do, yeah, why don't we do a tiebreaker here? You can say it again. A. Okay. My wife and I are also trying to learn sign language, so she gave me the the sign language for A. All right. So Yellowstone National Park for our season one finale. Should be a lot of fun. With that, today we talked about Arches National Park, of course. Uh, we talked about Edward Abbey and red foxes, and then we finished off with salt tectonics. I'll post, or fractals, if you can post up that uh, survey to the chat. I'd love your input on the show, uh, things you'd like to change, uh, suggestions, improvements. I will pull all of those together. If I can make changes for the last episode, I will, but otherwise I will uh, pull those in for season two. So still very much appreciated. If you want to come hang out in the Discord community, that's a great place to go post, uh, talk about national parks, just want to go fly together, that sort of thing. We'll also use Discord for hanging out uh, after season one ends. Um, so that's a, a good place to get those links if you want them. You can also find them in the flight plans. I put them on there. And let me see. Yeah, I was going to say picked by accident. <laughs> that's really good. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, okay, so great. I'm excited to explore Yellowstone National Park with you all next week. With that, thank you for being my co-pilot today, and until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I will see you all next week. <laughs>